Thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, and uh, thank you to the Boston Society of Architects and the Loeb Fellowship. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to be here tonight. Um, in particular, thanks to uh, Sally Young and Jim Stockard of the Loeb Fellowship, who are just wonderful leaders of that program. And thank you to Julie, who's going to um, help me give my talk tonight. Um, thank you, Chris, for the introduction. Uh, just to build on Chris's introduction a little bit, um, I co-founded the Canary Project in 2006 uh, with my collaborator, co collaborator and husband, Edward Morris. Um, and when we started the project, it was a, a, a photography project um, with a fairly straightforward goal of photographing landscapes. Um, but uh, we complicated things for ourselves by wanting to show these photographs um, to a diverse and, and broad public, which very early on in the work um, brought us into contact with different types of media. We began working with designers, educators, scientists to bring the work um, outside of the gallery and the, the art uh, venues um, to a, a broader public. Um, and and it, it just kept growing from there. Um, and we ended up producing and collaborating on projects um, completely independent from the photography. So I'll be showing some of those this evening along with um, talking about the photography project. Um, this talk uh, is something that uh, I developed along with Ed last September. And we generally uh, give this talk together. Um, but Ed is uh, not here, so I'm going to do it myself. Um, <laughs> and we'll see, so, uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, it's, it's not a very traditional talk. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to present uh, 33 provocations on climate change. Um, each one is one minute. And sometimes I'll have to speak quickly to get it in a minute. And other times, there'll be silence. Um, it's uh, inspired by John Cage's indeterminacy. Um, and with that, um, could we have the, uh, the lights down a little bit so the, the screen will look a little bit better? Yeah, that's good. OK. One. So it turns out that if you put a ton of ice on a park bench in New York, people will either ignore it or think it's mildly amusing. Some will have fun trying to destroy it. This is an excerpt of a 40-minute video by John Santos for the Canary Project. One person John filmed stabbed the ice repeatedly with an ice pick. In a way, it was the one gesture that seemed admirable, weirdly constructive. We wondered if this kind of energy isn't needed more in the sustainability movement. In general, it seems that the adventure of this piece is the contrast of different concepts of time. Ice time, measured by the pace of its melting. New York time generally, the pace of passing. And personal time, one couple breaks up on the bench behind the ice. One couple skates on top of it, many rush by. Several seem to have nothing better to do than sit on a bench. It's difficult to tap into the frequency of a different sort of time, such as geologic time particularly when we are so busy. Two. Here is one way of putting time in perspective. This image is from an exhibit that I saw in Indiana last summer. The coiled rope is 38 feet long. The red tag at the center represents 4.5 billion years ago, when they tell us time on Earth began. The free end represents now. The green arrow on the right indicates 65 million years ago. It's about six inches from the end. This marks the extinction of the dinosaurs. The orange arrow to the right at the end points to two million years ago, where we humans more or less come about. The other pieces of red tape represent other developments in the origin and evolution of life. One of the remarkable things about this is how long records indicate that there was no life at all on planet Earth, the distance to the first red tape. Three. Here again is another perspective on time. It shows mass extinction events as evidenced in the fossil record. The spikes you see represent mass extinctions over the past 500 million years. One of the many, one of the many species, of the many species that have existed on Earth, 
scientists estimate more than 45 billion have come and gone. What causes these dramatic die-offs is a matter of intense debate, but it is commonly believed that the majority of these extinctions took place during five mass extinctions. In general, it would seem that the conditions on Earth supporting life changed, and that the few species who could adapt or for whom the new conditions were more favorable survived and thrived. Mammals, including humans, rise from the ashes of what destroyed the dinosaurs. Many biologists think that we are currently in the throes of the sixth mass extinction that is caused by human stresses. Four. But ultimately, graphs like these are unbelievable. They feel almost whimsical, arbitrary. To feel their meaning, you have to provide a lot of power with your own imagination. To get at something like a feeling for the past, we have to try from different angles. There have only been around 100 generations since the founding of the Roman Empire. I found this astounding. If I lined up my ancestors in a row, I could see them all in a glance. This means that enormous change happens every generation, and that we are in the middle of such change now. Is it possible that consciousness, like physical form, has evolved in that time? That it can evolve? And if so, towards what? Five. In the spring of 2005, Ed and I read a series of articles by Elizabeth Colbert in the New Yorker magazine. The series titled The Climate of Man is now a book titled Field Notes from a Catastrophe. The articles were just that, field notes from Colbert's travels to several locations around the world where scientists are studying the impacts of climate change. The articles were stark and they startled us from our mild concern about climate change to feeling like we needed to do something to raise awareness, as Colbert's articles had done for us. Our initial plan was fairly straightforward. I would photograph the changing landscape in various locations where climate impacts are most evident, including some of the places that Colbert visited. Then we would show the images to as broad and diverse an audience as possible. Six. In deciding what locations to shoot for the project, we had two primary criteria. One, to show that climate change is global, so it was important that the locations spread out across the world. Two, to show the diversity of impacts. This and the following images show the five types of impacts I shot in a total of 14 locations. The impact types include glacial, ice cap, and permafrost melting, as shown here in this image of the Pasterzi Glacier in the Austrian Alps. Extreme weather events. Plaquemines Parish, New Orleans. Disrupted ecosystems, Belize. Rising sea levels, Bangladesh. Drought and fires, Western China. Seven. Photographs are instants of time. What can these traces of the past do? Can they have agency? Photocritic Ariella Azoulay says that, says that photographs of disaster and horror do not speak for themselves, that they must be activated by a kind of viewing anchored in civic duty. The viewer, not the subject or the photographer, holds the real key to the image's power. Viewing images in this way anchors spectatorship and civic duty, a contract of sorts, that is participatory and political. The term contract here allows us to shed terms commonly used to describe the act of looking at images of disaster, such as empathy, shame, pity, or compassion. Such feelings serve the viewer more than the subject. I've always felt squeamish about photographing people in Canary Project locations for fear of failing to represent the complexity of their lives but Azoulay's writings began to provide a bridge. Eight. For reasons including the sense of shame I alluded to, there are no people in most Canary Project images. And yet people are the reason I care about climate change. With this in mind, we started recently working with a young artist named Amanda Burr. 
to record interviews with people who are experiencing changes to the land that could be attributed to climate change. The resulting archive, like the photography, is flexible. It can be edited for narrative or allowed to float like allegory. Here's a short clip on fires that is part of a larger loop exploring bravado in the face of disaster. I found myself uh, extremely comfortable around fire um, soon after the fire reached this property. I thought that, you know, fire was really intense, but I could stand right, right near a tree burning. Uh, as long as the wind wasn't blowing in my face, uh, it was okay. Nine. Both the photography and the sound recordings are like fossils. Defined by a body of knowledge. And at the same time, emitting the trace of a past existence that cannot fully be absorbed. Ten. So there are these different continuums of time, different veins of which we are a part and which are directly per pertinent to the understanding of climate change. That is to say, our understanding of ecology, the world into which we appear and from which we vanish. This clip from another video by John K Santos for the Canary Project brings to mind the following quotation from Philip Brooks, although it's in a very different key. It goes like this. The little insect that crawls upon the tree and creeps in one short day of ours through the experiences from life to death, in a short 24 hours of his life begins, mature and ends, birth, youth, activity, age, decrepitude, all crowded and compressed into these moments that slip away, uncounted, in one day of human life. Is his life long or short? Is his life long or short to him? 11. And with this insect as an example, we circle around the slippery word, the environment, as put forward in the wonderful 1934 Jacob von Oetzel essay, A Stroll Through the Worlds of Animal and Men. I present the ecology of the much maligned tick. The tick's environment is defined by the sensory perception of three things and three things only, heat, light, and the scent of butyric acid, which is emitted by the tick's warm-blooded prey. It often waits for long periods of time on a blade of grass for the perfect moment to jump off and attach itself to prey like you. The tick's life is governed by its environment, which consists solely of these three effectors, for lack of a better word. Thinking of the environment in this way, in terms of what in the world we're affected by and what we affect, I counter the definition of the environment as something found in a national park. The environment is a myriad of conditions which affect our daily life. And thinking about the environment in these terms necessitates that work on ecology and the environment consider boundaries between the body and the physical environment. 12. As animals who spend most of our time indoors or in vehicles, most of us barely know how to read the land. Once you start to learn even a little, you're confronted everywhere with absence. You're drawn back into the past, and this seems at first the only direction you can go. You see glaciers and the striations on the stone, the, f the flatness of the valley on the foot of the mountain, the meltwater, the rocks left behind a thousand years ago by the withdrawal of a nearly unimaginable force. Yet feeling the past in this way is like taking a few hard steps up a hill, gaining elevation from which you ultimately hope to see in all directions, even the future. Thirteen. The photographs I took for the Canary Project are landscapes, places that scientists say the impacts of climate change are evident. I'd like to take a minute, literally, to talk about landscape, another slippery term. Landscape is an idea, not a place. 
it is a culturally defined idea of place, a kind of framing device. Unlike nature, which is thought to be autonomous, landscape is interpreted. Landscape is not static. It is constantly changing and being modified by both natural and human forces. Some of the forces shape, shaping landscape are the flow of water, grazing animals, pollution, war, wind, volcanoes, development, etc. Landscape is shaped by many forces. We have focused on climate change. Anne Spurn says that our ability to transform landscape now exceeds our ability to comprehend it. 14. In selecting where to photograph for the Canary Project, we consulted with scientists, first broadly and strategically, and then locally. What I photographed was often following the pointing index finger of a local scientist just describing a perceived impact of climate change. I would take GPS and then return to spend more time shooting and often be met by an eerie calm silence. Fifteen. Early on in the project, I was asked to do a telephone interview with a radio station in southern Illinois. A couple of days before the interview, the host let me know that he didn't believe in all this climate change nonsense and that he liked to have a little fun on the air. This was my first radio interview, so I started to get really nervous. I studied up and I put a bunch of post-its and books and I had the books all laid out in front of me. Good thing it was radio. And when we got on the air, the host kept asking me questions, prefaced with the phrase, your camp, as in your camp seems to believe, or your camp is telling us. Finally, I lashed out and I said, hold on, you keep saying my camp. Well, let's define who's in my camp. In my camp, first and foremost, is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change convened by the UN and the World Meteorological Organization. In my camp is the National Science Academy, which cre was created by Abraham Lincoln to advise the government on scientific matters. Also in my camp is the National Science Academy of the G8 nations, Brazil and Indiana. In my camp 16. Is, is science the new religion? Contemporary philosopher Zizek says that science today does effectively compete with religion insofar as it provides two ideological needs, those for hope and those for censorship, which were traditionally taken care of by the church. Hope is fairly straightforward. Science provides shelter from uncertainty and a point of reference on which we can rely. But what about censorship? If science has become a universal discourse whose knowledge is truth, then it should have power to silence differing views or opinions. But the climate change debate shows that this is not the case. We may wish it were the case, but we live in a democratic society and people have the right to believe in scientific consensus or dismiss it. Seventeen. This trust in scientific consensus is a trust in process, not truth. A trust in scientists, not science with a capital S. Nonetheless, such a respect for authority puts us in an awkward position as artists. Given that most art, particularly most political art from the 19th century forward, is concerned with questioning, critiquing, nuancing, and resisting. But let's look closer. We are merely beginning with the observation that we cannot independently test any proposition on climate change. The IPCC may say one thing, and Richard Lindzen, probably the most well-known critic or skeptic, may say another. But we can't walk out the door, take a few measurements, and prove one or the other false. An opinion on climate change is an absurd thing. If I had one point on which I would become an evangelist, this would be it. We are getting this signal from what we might call the scientific community. What we do with it. 18. In the beginning of the project, we felt a primary responsibility to convince people to educate. Climate change is real, it's urgent, we can do something. We felt a secondary responsibility to something more awkward to express. But let's 
call it a responsibility to understanding, to complexity, to a search for truth that never seems to finish. At some point, this order of priorities flipped. Our primary responsibility now, we feel, is towards searching, exploring aspects of human psychology that lie behind the predicament of climate change and our inability to respond. Our secondary responsibility is towards convincing and inspiring. These responsibilities can actually work against each other because the optimistic view is not always the honest one. And the honest view is never simple, never easy to grasp. This leads to a sort of schizophrenia on top of the paranoia we feel as believers in the possibility of a doom that nobody, including ourselves, really takes. 19. This is an image of glacial runoff in Peru at the Pasteurzi Glacier in the Andes. It was the first glacier I shot in Peru in the spring of 2008. Scientists working there brought me here first because this place has particular resonance in Peru. As it's relatively accessible, it was formerly a national attraction similar to Yosemite. However, the road leading to trails to view the glacier are now closed to the public because there is very little left to see. The glacier has almost completely melted. Scientists predict that all glaciers in the Andes will be gone by 2025. It's hard to imagine the unearthly peaks of the Andes without glaciers, but that aside, millions of people depend on glacial runoff for drinking water, irrigation, and hydroelectric power. Twenty. Most of Peru's population lives on the coast, which is a desert, eight million in Lima alone. During the dry season, drinking water comes from glacial runoff. But since Peru's glaciers are predicted to be gone in 15 years, unless Peru begins implementing massive engineering projects, there will be a water crisis. In Lima, water activists brought me to two communities to photograph urban drought. Here, informal communities are being built into the dry foothills surrounding Lima and also into the dunes near the ocean. There is no running water, so it is supplied daily by water trucks that come around to fill plastic barrels in front of people's homes. People buy and use water according to their budgets. The water here is more expensive than in the witty, uh, wealthiest parts of the city center, where water is supplied through pipes by the municipality. As water becomes scarcer, prices will go up, and the people least able to afford it will feel the greatest impact. 21. Is this, half, is this image half empty or half full? The place is the Sahel region of Africa, a strip of semi-arid land that separates the Saharan desert from more fertile regions of uh, southern Africa. Its inhabitants mostly survive through subsistence farming and are therefore extremely vulnerable to drought and changes in climate. As Chris Marker said, the Sahel is not only what is shown of it when it is too late, it is the land that drought seeps into, like water into a leaking boat. The image, though, is half full. Each circle is hand dug and represents a potential tree. This type of land restoration and tree planting can be seen all over Niger, which is one of the poorest countries in the world. Despite, despite extremely limited resources, the government and NGOs working in Niger do not have the luxury to debate the finer points of policy, but are acting to mitigate and adapt to climate change now. 22. This Friday, I'm going to the Netherlands to shoot and do research for a book project that compares the cultures of planning in the Netherlands and New Orleans in light of their vulnerability to climate change. Most people think of the Netherlands and think of a low-lying nation with fair-minded people, a land of water windmills and tulips. But in my mind, taking this trip to the Netherlands is like going to outer space to visit a special planet inhabited by sane, advanced group of beings. The remarkable thing about the Netherlands, in my mind, is not that they have been preparing for the impacts of climate change for decades, or that they have centuries of experience in water management, but rather it is their new policy called Room for the River, which seeks to reclaim land from human use, such as farming, for floodplains for the river, or to cut a groove in a dike to allow pressure off the system. It requires that children... 23. The Tragedy of Commons is an influ influential article first published in 1968 that describes a dilemma in which multiple individuals acting independently in their own self-interest can ultimately destroy a shared limited resource. 
even when it is clear that it is not in anyone's long-term interest to do so. The hypothetical example is of herders sharing a common parcel of land, the commons, on which they are all entitled to let their cows graze. Theoretically, it is in each herder's interest to put as many cows as possible onto the land, even if the commons are damaged as a result, because the herder receives all of the benefits from the additional cows, while the damage to the commons is shared by the entire group. If all herders make this individually rational decision, however, the commons are destroyed and all the herders suffer. 24. This photograph is a 20-foot mural titled Mirror. It is a photograph rendered imaginary through its own qualities and doubling. Initially, I was at a loss as how to shoot in Antarctica, which was always an imaginary place for me at the end of the world, or at least those are its qualities that seemed most viable in the, con in the context of the Canary Project. I wanted to make images that would make me feel nostalgic for something lost that I never really knew, only felt. Making real images of Antarctica seemed tantamount to saying, I am certain about the future. Twenty-five. Albedo is a measure of reflectivity, normally applied to celestial bodies such as Earth. The wider the surface, the more reflective it is, meaning more solar radiation backs, bounces back and less is absorbed. Think about wearing a black t-shirt on a hot day. Ice and snow are white. When they melt, the Earth gets less reflective, warmer. So more ice melts and it gets even warmer, which melts more ice, etc. This is one of many feedback loops in climate that threaten a complete flip in the climate regime, and one of the several reasons why melting of the polar ice caps is of such grave concern. What can we do about this? One night in early 2007, five albedo pilgrims visited us and told us we were to start a campaign to encourage people to wear white, to increase the overall reflectivity of the Earth, like Gandhi. This campaign is called Increase Your Albedo. It is part of a proud lineage of fashion industry activism campaigns. 26. The pilgrims make their first appearance in New York City. The pilgrims wear white to encourage people to reflect on what they can do. Unsuspecting attendee at this Chelsea opening finds himself in conversation with the mysterious pilgrims. He is disappointed to find that they only wish to speak of reflectivity and changing atmosphere. Then 550 used white shirts appeared in a cloud on Little West 12th Street. The shirts were refashioned for the pilgrims into new dresses. The pilgrims in new dresses set off to make a landing in Queens at the so Socrates Sculpture Park. Twenty-six. These are from a recent installation called Quartet for the End of Time. Why poker? Well, it's fair to point out that there's tremendous uncertainty in climate science, particularly with respect to the future and how catastrophic warming might be. But it's also extremely aggravating to hear people hear this, hear people make this point and throw up their hands and say, see, climate change is a hoax. What is certain after all? What can you as an individual actually verify? Can you verify that man has been on the moon? Can you verify the principle of evolution? When we speak of knowing, we always truly speak of belief. And we routinely make decisions without firm knowledge of what outcomes will be, or firm knowledge of circumstances affecting our decisions. This is the condition of poker, where the best players make calculated decisions based on risk. The question is, why are we so comfortable making such decisions as individuals, but unable to make such decisions as a group for the benefit of all? 27. And then there is our own front lawn, your so-called private property. This photograph is of Fritz Haig's Edible Estates, taken by the Canary Project for a book. Fritz's Edible Estates proposes the replacement of the domestic front lawn with a highly productive 
edible landscape. Or as Fritz states in his manifesto-esque introduction to his book, edible estates is an attack on the front lawn and everything he has come to represent. Edible estates reconciles issues of global food production and urbanized land use with the modest gesture of a small domestic garden. Fritz's pro uh, process is that he seeks a willing family and works with them to tear out their front lawn and plant a garden. The family keeps the garden. He documents the process. We helped with this and then writes about it, and it is deemed art by the Whitney and the Tate and other such institutions. Twenty-eight. In 2007, Eve Mosher drew a chalk line around 70 miles of coast in Brooklyn and Manhattan, showing the combined effect of sea level rise and increased frequency of storms. The Canary Project co-produced this piece. Over the two-month period that she drew the line, Eve encountered thousands of people and talked to anyone who was interested in the work. She also handed out action packets to help people understand how they could reduce their own carbon emissions. Two points about Eve's project. First, Eve chose to make the line in chalk, which is impermanent, to highlight that the line is not set in stone and that there is still time to act. Second, the line went through both public and private property, raising questions about how we will manage lands, particularly lands that provide ecological services, such as wetlands, in the future. Twenty-nine. Each of these projects infiltrates everyday life, either by intervening on the pace of everyday life, as Eve's piece does, people see her going by, hey, what's that, and come up and talk to her, or by making a piece out of an everyday sort of activity, such as gardening, or by drawing attention to the larger meanings of individual everyday actions. One of the upshots of such a strategy is, res is a respect for your audience. There is less of a barrier to access. You don't need an art vocabulary. The other benefit is that the philosophical d divide between art and life becomes permeable, almost irrelevant. Some might say this loss of art's autonomy has a possible downside. Don't you have to be situated outside in order to critique with integrity? I'm not sure. But even if that were the case, perhaps this would be a bargain worth making. Trade the power to deconstruct. 30. This is another recent installation called Mount Ararat. The wooden sculpture perched on the stacks of newspaper is a two-scale model of Noah's Ark, as described in Genesis. The story of Noah's Ark is one of many remarkably similar myths of great floods, such as the earlier version of Gilgamesh and the later version in the Quran. What fascinates me about the Ark is that regardless of our religious background, we all have an unknowable and shadow-like picture of the Ark in our minds. It serves as a wonderfully malleable base for a piece exploring ideas of catastrophe, our belief that magic will save us, possibilities of destruction, and also utopia. Along with the sculpture, which is six feet long, we made a video piece in which we interviewed a cast of all-purpose experts, professors in various fields at the university where we were visiting artists. The following is a one-minute clip from that video. Well, everyone knows, well, not everyone, but um, you have the creation story. Um, you have the fall. And then somehow in between that and Noah's Ark, the world becomes populous, uh, humans spread. And um, things don't go according to plan. Um, the people that were in existence at that time after some generations after the story of the Garden of Eden and the creation had become very displeasing to God. And the populations had become rather dense. They were also sinful, I suppose we could say. And so God uh, decided to destroy all of humanity at one point, but then he relented a bit and decided to... Uh, not destroy everybody. So he feels that Noah is one of the few people that deserve to live. Right. Um, well, Noah lived in um, Mesopotamia, Sumer, I think, but I'm not sure. 
but um, 33 time lately I can't escape this theme is it possible to go cultivate a sense of shared history a sense of belonging to an evolutionary continuum a sense of responsibility a sense of self-interest that is intrinsically ecological where would that get us even assuming that we could accomplish it I don't know are we really more advanced than the superorganism of an ant colony? Against the grain of this long view, we have the immediate future, the funny feeling that over our heads a clock is ticking, a feeling that time might be running out. Thank you very much for coming, and I'd love to answer questions if you have any. Well, I, I'm, I'm actually returning to the Netherlands. I did shoot there in 2007. And um, when I was there previously, I really looked at uh, and super engineering projects, which the Dutch are known for and very, very good at. Um, they're, and they're very hard defenses. You know, they don't sort of accept uh, any water in the system. Um, and, and I also shot in New Orleans three months after the hurricane. Um, and I, I was just incredibly struck um, in the Netherlands in particular at the kind of self-assured um, uh, atmosphere that the people who I, the experts I met with uh, had um, in talking about their level of preparedness and uh, how kind of deeply practical they seemed and, um, and, and, and able to deal with the problem. Um, and this was, you know, in, in stark contrast to the absolute chaos that you know, we found in, in New Orleans in that area after the hurricane. Um, so since then, though, I, I heard about um, this, 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 this sort of softening approach, this more uh, flexible sort of philosophy to dealing with the problem of water in the Netherlands, um, which it, it, it provides for an opportunity for more of a, a partnership with, uh, with nature where, you know, you would you would make a little bit of room for the water and take pressure off the off the system. Um, so I'll be there's actually 40 sites that have been um, designated by the government that they're uh, allowing room for the river. You know, and in some cases it means digging uh, a canal deeper than it currently is. And uh, but in other cases it actually means reclaiming farmland, and they they're 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 actually. Uh, moving the, the farmhouse of the farmer to higher land, like building a mound, <laughs> so that if their land is inundated, their home won't be. Um, so I'm, I'm going to look at some of those sites, and certainly not all 40 of them. Um, but I'm also interested in, there's a site near Amsterdam that was being reclaimed, um, along with three other areas. And, uh, but some things went wrong when they were draining it. and. Uh, things uh, got held up, and in the meantime, uh, a, a bunch of birds uh, made their home there. And there was a sort of critical mass when the government realized that they had sort of a, a nature preserve on their hands, and that they had to stop development. And it's now a nature preserve, and one of the biggest bird estuaries in, in, uh, uh, in all of Europe. Um, and I'm really interested in it, because apparently the, the the, the man who's in charge of developing it now is a nature park, um, has this goal of returning the land to some kind of pre-man state, which in the ne Netherlands is a kind of incredible idea because the Netherlands is completely engineered. You know, everything is, is man-made, really. So I'm, I'm quite interested in that site, too.
Yeah. Oh, that's that's a really good question. Um, as I mentioned during the talk, um, I regard the photographs as being very malleable and flexible, and they've um, they've been exhibited in uh, everything from sort of one extreme of uh, science museums, uh, in which case they are accompanied by a great deal of very specific language about the the sites and um, the impacts that are evident in the images um, to also the sides of buses where they're accompanied by a kind of uh, alarming uh, language that can be taken in um, as a bus passes by. Um, to more recently, um, there was uh, one image in there where you saw like an elephant skull in the foreground and then there was all these uh, pedestals with objects and then the photographs were on the wall. Um, in that installation, we paired the photographs with objects curated from various uh, disciplines at Indiana University and had no captions, although they were available in a gallery guide. But we wanted people to, um, to try to make a connection between what is at stake kind of in terms of time and these concepts of time I was talking about in the images with these objects that are drawn from different um, fields of knowledge and sort of like be able to feel that. Um, and then, you know, obviously have the information um, available if they wanted to read it, but have that be sort of optional. So, so um, in, in general, I rarely exhibit the photographs without uh, scientific information. Um, and they're, they're cataloged um, according to their impact and then location and date, and so they, and then a, a number. So they, they have this kind of like very scientific e type title each image does um, that categorizes them. Um, but uh, I don't know, yeah, when I was making this talk, I think, uh, I think I was feeling like a little bit downtrodden because recently, uh, I don't know if people are following the polls on this, but we've actually gone backward um, in how many people uh, believe in climate change, which is kind of, I can't, it's hard for me to figure out how that's happening. You know, if like last year you believed in climate change and now you're just not sure. <laughs> so, you know, after doing this work for four years or so, I'm uh, just, you know, not feeling totally optimistic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. This is this is a it's a very interesting question because um, when we started the project, we were if if you had a spectrum of advocacy on one end and art on the other end, um, because our our work kind of operates across that spectrum. Um, when we started the project, I would say I would say we're we were quite firmly on the activism side. We were like, we need to make visual evidence because, you know, people, uh, rational people will see something and believe it, you know, it's like, uh, and, um, and as I alluded to in the talk, I feel like my, um, my impulse with what the images have the power to do has, has shifted as I've developed the body of work and spent time in these places and spent time developing the body of work where I, I do feel like, um, they may have more power in an um, emotive sense now, or like a sort of emotional way necessarily th than as uh, strictly advocacy. Um, so we've along the way developed other projects that are um, squarely advocacy, um, including one called Green Patriot Posters, uh, which is a, a poster project um, that seeks to find kind of a strong message and uh, upbeat messaging in uh, design uh, that to promote sustainability. And uh, uh, we have a, a book called Green Patriot Posters that's coming out in the fall. And uh, actually we're really thrilled because um, Michael Beirut's initial design for the Green Patriot poster 
campaign, which was on the sides of buses in, Kim, uh, in Cleveland, um, is in the Cooper Hewitt Triennial right now. So that was, that was really thrilling. So we, we ended up kind of getting around that problem by having projects that are squarely advocacy and others that are squarely like art. Yeah. But it's inherently harder to know, except that they might project as a sort of actual insult, if not necessarily evidence for something. Right. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the question of whether or not to do before and after photographs came up pretty early in the project. And, and there's some, some excellent um, projects working in that mode. Um, Gary Barash is a, a photographer based in Oregon that has shot a lot of glaciers in that, in that way. Um, and they, and it's it's particularly useful with glaciers because you can measure their melting. And um, and I, you know, I I chose to to not do that because I I tend to when I see those those images, I'm I'm really fascinated in them because it's 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 amazing to see how much melt there is. But I also tend to experience them as as data. You know, my I'll go back and forth and I'll try to you know measure. Uh, what I'm seeing in the image, and I, I wanted to I wanted to see if I could make images that um, where you you might sort of feel the uh, the loss of the glacier. The the first time I went to a glacier, which was Austria, um, I had never been around one, and uh, it, it's the Pasteurzee glacier, um, which uh, is quite famous in 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 Austria, and um, and I was just totally floored by the experience. I mean, they're, they're massive and, and, and gorgeous things. And, and I felt like I was in the presence of sort of like a dying thing, grand thing. And so uh, the image that was up there, I mean, I ended up printing it quite dark, you know, in this moody sort of way to, to convey that, that sense. So I guess in summary, I would say, I feel like there's, um, there's certainly a role for photography as as evidence, particularly in the scientific community. And I think it's useful for people, too, to also be able to see um, and uh, to actually be able to measure with their eyes what's happening. Yeah. yeah. Did you say the name of that artist again? Gary Barash. Gary Barash. It's uh, B-A-R. No, Gary Barash. B A R B A. It's it's a weird spelling. It's got like S C H at the end. And if but if you Google like climate change photography and he'll come up because he's yeah. Google will Google take care of it. Yeah. Oh gosh, what is that image? That's one of those great sublime painters from, um, oh, which one is it? I can't remember. I can give you my card and email it to you because I can't remember right now. It's one of the big sublime painters from about 1860. So does anyone know? <laughs> Nature, yeah, the, the, sub, the, that sort of school of painting, or for that period, there was, you know, nature was evoked as this very powerful and, and sort of dangerous but beautiful thing. Like, involved in the beauty was, was the danger. And uh, so, you know, that you might feel some fear of God was part of what you would experience in, in light of the viewing the painting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>